Hello and welcome back to Expedition 44. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm glad you're here with us. And today we are continuing our series, uh, Citizens of the Kingdom. So thanks for joining us. In week one, we looked at Christiformity, so being conformed to the image of Christ. And last week, we looked at the gospel of the kingdom and that saw that the gospel was all about Jesus's kingship and looked at how we can be a, a witness by being kingdom people and conforming to the image of our king. So uh, we talked about last week, the five parts of the kingdom, which are a king, which we kind of covered in weeks one and two. And uh, the second part is a rule, which is we're talking about living under the reign of Christ today. And then uh, we're going to get into the other parts in the series coming up, which is uh, a people where we're, we'll talk about the church, uh, a law, where we'll look at kind of the Sermon on the Mount and um uh, the, the Jesus Creed, as Scott McKnight calls it, loving your neighbor as yourself and loving the Lord with all your heart. And then we'll look at a land, how all of this ties into, um, I guess, the new heavens and new earth, uh, our eschatology. Um, so that's all in the weeks to come. So today, we're like I said, we're looking at God's rule and reign and how we should live under his ruling. So and this is kind of usually the, the rule part is the modern definition of what the kingdom is. And sometimes they neglect the other four aspects of, of the kingdom. So the, the king, the people, the, the law and the land. So um, we need to rethink kind of this. And I think if we begin this, this, when we begin the story of rain, like we talked about last week, we need to look at the whole lens of, of scripture. So we, we did that last week and looked at that, but today I want to specifically look at what's called what I call the, the meta narrative or the spiritual kind of meta narrative. And now a meta narrative is um, it, it works in tandem with the narrative of the Bible, the whole, whole sequence of uh, the way the story of scripture plays out. Um, but we're going to really look at the, um, the spiritual aspect of it and um, the battle of, as you could say, the principalities and powers against uh, the kingdom of God. So the kingdoms of this world, uh, versus the kingdoms of God and how that plays out through the whole Bible and what um, it informs us about of how we how we need to live as citizens of the kingdom of God. So here's the way that, um, and you've probably heard if you've listened to Exhibition 44 for a while, the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, and that's kind of a coined term from Dr. Michael Heiser from the Naked Bible podcast and his books, The Unseen Realm, where it talks about um, kind of the spiritual worldview um, of, of the, the Jewish and Hebrew world. So or I'm going to kind of run through that quick so that we kind of have a framework to work with as we move forward um, today and look at how we're supposed to live in this world. Um, so both of the met narrative and the meta narrative begin in the same place. God creates humanity. He creates, he creates humanity to be to his image, his representatives here. Um, on earth um then we kind of know in genesis 3 about uh the serpent and the fall and humanity usurps god's authority and rule and chooses to live by their own wisdom and their own rule and um we see then after that in genesis the downward spiral so we got the flood where god kind of hits the reset button um the, then after that is kind of where i think the story focuses in a little bit with the tower of babel in genesis 10 and 11 and uh at this point, when God divides up the nations, um, he is essentially disinheriting, disinheriting the nations. Um, it, when we look at Moses's reaccounting of this in Deuteronomy 32, specifically verse 8, it said that um, God placed an Elohim, a spiritual being, a principality and power over these nations, these 70 nations, and, but he chose Israel as his own. And then we see in, Deut in Psalm 82 that these Elohim corrupted the nations and brought injustice to uh, these kingdoms. And actually, the first time we see kingdom in the Bible, it's not in a positive light. It's um, a system of uh, violence, and you kind of tie that into these principalities and powers. So right after the Tower of Babel, we see the call of Abraham, where Abraham and then Israel through him, uh, he makes covenants with them, and Israel is God's portion, as we saw. And the purpose of Israel is to be a light to these nations. Uh, Israel fails, and they worship the gods of these nations, and they end up in exile. And that's kind of a lot of the story of the Old Testament. Uh, when we get to the New Testament, Jesus comes as the true Israelite, the true image bearer, 
to rescue these nations from the spiritual powers. Um, these kingdoms of the world kill Jesus. God raises him up as the true king. Then he raises him from the dead. On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's poured out, and what uh, some call the third race, which is Jew and Gentile, we see in Ephesians chapter 2 that the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles is torn down, and God makes one new humanity out of the two. And so we see that with, with the church. Um, so, and the gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed through the church, and they're called to transfer people out of the kingdoms of this world and into his kingdom. And one day Jesus will return to destroy the powers that have been bound. So the powers haven't been destroyed yet. Um, they've been dethroned, but they're still there in place. And I believe they're still behind the empires and the, the kingdoms of this world and the systems of this world. Um, but God's, when Jesus returns, he's going to set up that not yet kingdom. So uh, we see in this biblical narrative, uh, I believe it's still true today that there are two kingdoms. There's the world, the kingdom of this world. And there's the kingdom of God. And I believe that all the structures and systems of this world are influenced by Satan and the powers. And the Bible um, uses the word, I think, cosmos, which sometimes translated as world, to, to talk about these things. And usually when, when you see the word cosmos, uh, you will have usually three definitions in the Bible. So one would be uh, when we think of it as all of creation or, or the earth is the first definition. And the second would be uh, the people of the earth or the things that reside within this structure. And the third thing is, it's the systems of this world, which are under the enemy. Um, and I think quite often the Bible uses that. Some verses that we might look at to determine this is First uh, John 5, 19. It says the world is under the control of the evil one. And it contrasts that with the children of God not being of the world. Um, then we got James 4, 4. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Um, when we look at the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew chapter four, the devil offers Jesus the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus doesn't dispute that he owns them. He just says that that's not um, his prerogative is to worship the devil. That's not how um, Jesus rolls. The power over uh, style is not the way that Jesus rules. And we'll get more into this. Um Mark 8, 36 says, what good is it to gain the whole world and yet lose your soul? Uh, John 15, 19 says, if you belong to the world, it, it would love you as its own. But it, Jesus goes on to say, but this is the why the world hates you is because you don't belong to it. You belong to the kingdom of God. Um, John 18, 36, when Jesus is on trial, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And what I believe he means there is my kingdoms aren't like the kingdoms of this world. Cause he goes on to say, if they were, then my disciples would be fighting to would be taking up violence on my behalf. Uh, we get to um, Galatians four, three and Colossians two, eight, both use this term stoicheia, which is elemental forces or spiritual powers, which both say that the spiritual powers are over this world, that you were once under those spiritual powers, but now you're, in the kingdom of God. So both uh, Galatians 4.3 and Colossians 2.8. And then we got 2 Peter 2.20. It says, if you've escaped this world and have again become entangled to it, you're worse off than you were before. So it's talking about um, escaping the ways of this world and going back. And I believe that um, the, in the Bible, if you've ever looked at the, the guy Demas, Paul says that he left the way and went back to be entangled with with the world. He said that he deserted Paul because he was entangled with the world. Um, so the way that I see it is we have two teams in this world. So we got team A, which is the world systems, the principalities and powers. We have empires. The powers are basically the puppet masters behind these empires. Um, now, government structures, I believe that God allows them in this um, I guess, hierarchical, political, um, governmental structures of nations. Um, God didn't ever, doesn't ever say in the Bible that they're good. I believe he can use them for good, just like Joseph in Genesis 50, what you meant for evil, God can for good. In Romans 8, 28, where we look eschatologically at God will work all things out for the good. Um, I believe that God can use in I guess these types of structures for his good. And 
governments are meant to keep order. And I believe God allows them in this world to keep the world from being even more chaotic than it could be. I believe that's really what Romans 13 is all about is uh, kind of a police state and keeping order. He sets up these, he allows these structures so that there's, there's order, but it never says that this is his ideal. I remember last week to our ABA outline of, of the kingdom of God, that, that ABA story, uh, go back and contrast that with this. Now, team B, um, the kingdom of God is that one, and we're called to be a light to the nations. Remember, we're not called to make the world a better place, but we're called to, as the church, be the better place in the midst of the world. Um, we are the kingdom of God within the kingdoms of this world. We're not called to take the world's structures and make them better. So we're called to live under the king's rule and his law as his people. Israel is called to be a light to the nations. They were never called to overtake the nations or go within their structures and and change them. So um, I think too many people in the church, um, Team B, are trying to overtake Team A, the systems of this world, by Team A's terms. So war, violence, politics, power over and not the kingdom way of Jesus, which is sacrifice, love, service, the power under this the servant mindset of Jesus. So, um, and this brings us to um, we talked about baptism last night, and we've gone through uh, baptism in our a bunch of our videos here on Expedition Forty Four. So go and check out some of those. But really, in the first century, um, baptism was not only an outward sign of an inward faith, but it was actually um, or just simply a religious ritual. It, it was a political pledge. And I'm not talking about becoming a Republican or becoming a Democrat, but it was a pledge to the kingdom of God. Now we see John the Baptist traveled through the region preaching that everyone should repent because the kingdom of God was finally about to arrive. And you can find that in Matthew chapter three at the beginning. And he says, repent, which in Greek is metanoia, um, which literally means to change your mind. So John proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and John's listeners um, would have seen this as turning away from your current allegiances, reorienting your life, submitting and purifying yourself as you await for the kingdom of God. It, it was it was political, especially in that Roman environment. And now, a lot of times, especially in uh, high church settings, or if you come from a Catholic or maybe orthodox type background, you uh, hear the word sacrament um, tied in with, with baptism. So this word sacrament is similar to what we talked about last week with gospel, that it wasn't a religious word. It was something that would have meant something when they heard it in the Greco-Roman uh, world there. And when we look um, at the legal term of it, the sacramentum in, in Greek was what two parties would bring when they came to court. They would each have a, a down payment, an earnest money that they would put down, showing the judge or the court that they were serious about the case that they were putting forward. Um, so sacrament is really about that. It later became a military term. So in that, a soldier would take the sacramentum the and there's some sources that say that they were literally baptized um, as their oath to Caesar or their oath to their king um, that they were pledging allegiance to obey their superiors, to not abandon their brothers in arms. It was a ritual that served as a covenant or agreement between the king and the people. And uh, Tacticus, um, who was a Roman senator and historian, referred to sacramentum as the verbal pledge of allegiance a soldier gave his empire. Um, to the emperor, uh, a military serving personnel, they were bound by the sacrament. And they did this um, ritual um, in front of people um, as a, um, as a spectacle, basically saying this is this is my allegiant pledge to my king. And now the early church viewed baptism as their sacramentum to Jesus. And uh, we see Tertullian, um, makes this contrast between Christian sacramentum and the Roman sacramentum, uh, basically saying that he makes the case that just as a soldier upon his oath of allegiance was inducted into Caesar's army, so a Christian was inducted based on baptism into the kingdom of God. 
Every person vowed faithful allegiance to his ruler and kingdom. So baptism into the empire or baptism into Christ's nation was really the dividing line is what Tertullian says. Um, he made a stark contrast between the empire and the kingdom of God. And so um, in our baptism video that we, we did um, a, a couple months back, um, we talked um, about 1 Peter 3. So I'm going to turn there right now and look at what they talked about in baptism there, starting in verse 17. Uh, for it is better if God should will to do so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sin once and for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit, in which he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, the ones who were disobedient, when the, the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not which is the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. So what we have here is, um, especially in verse 21, that it talks about an appeal, and that word appeal in Greek actually means a pledge of allegiance. It, it, it's an, of good conscience, so of loyalty, is what that could also be translated as, is baptism in the same way as a pledge of allegiance, a pledge of loyalty to Jesus. And um, we see the the image of the principalities and powers here um, and being tr transferred into the kingdom of God, you could say, and out from under the powers. Um, and it talks about um, the ark in the days of Noah, basically that remnant coming out from the evil ways of this world. Um, and that's the whole picture here of baptism is saying, hey, I'm, I'm part of this remnant. Um, I'm, baptism is spiritual warfare, basically you're saying, and all of the early baptismal formulas all had an aspect of the denunciation of the powers in it, in their, in their pledge before they would, they would be baptized. They all had a denunciation of Satan and, and, um, and the powers. So baptism really was a form of spiritual warfare, but it was also a pledge of being part of the kingdoms of God and forsaking um, the kingdoms of this world. And when we talk about sacramentum, it was earnest. It was the earnest money type, the legal aspect of it was that it was a serious matter that you were serious about this, this pledge and that you are now part of the army, uh, I guess you could say of, of God. All right. So um, in the class, we moved on to talking about um, about exile and identifying Babylon next. So empire or exile was a major thing to the Jews. So God had given them a land and God said that he would dwell with them in this land and that if the nation decided to go after other gods, God would vomit them out of the land. And that is what happened. Israel went and worshiped other gods and uh, the 10 Northern tribes were um, scattered um, by Assyria all over the North. And the Southern tribes were taken to Babylon in 586. The Southern tribes were then allowed to come back and rebuild the temple, but not all came back. And we can tell from the writings around there in the time of Jesus. And we've talked about this quite a bit, especially in our atonement series that the Jews considered themselves still to be in exile um, because they had foreigners ruling over them and God's physical presence hadn't returned to the temple. So really simply put, exile was God's people living under oppressive powers and they didn't cease to be his people. Israel was still God's people and he still planned to bring the Messiah about through them. Um, but they were not called to take up violence against the empire. They were called to live a different way and we're going to get into this shortly but right now we're kind of kicking off the idea of living as exiles um how did god call israel to live in exile um and we'll see coming up here when we look at some new testament stuff especially first peter that that on the in this world our citizenship isn't in the kingdoms of god uh, of this world but it's in the kingdom of god and we are 
called uh, the called exiles as in uh, first Peter uh, chapter one, right at the beginning of the book there. So we need to look at first, what is empire? And so we have in the Bible, a whole bunch of empires. We have Babylon, we have Persia, we got Greece, we got Rome. Um, and these are all, um, they all believed that God had given them the right to rule the world and to shape history. And I'm quoting here uh, from the book, Postcards from Babylon, which is uh, by Brian Zahn. Um, the second thing about it, an empire is that they all conquered through violence and war. And they all were rich and often exploited the poor. So those are kind of three things. And I got in a discussion, um, uh, Steve, the guy I'm co-teaching this class with, he got in a discussion with uh, some of his friends and I've had this actually thrown at me before that when, when we talk about Babylon, um, especially in the book of Revelation, and some people will um, put Babylon as an actual physical um, city that was where Babylon was in the Middle East, which is, I believe, around Iraq today, um, and not some kind of code word for any kind of empire um, coming out in the future. And that's usually a dispensationalist view. And I'm not dispensationalist, so I, I usually don't take that view. And I tend to go back to what, what did the early church fathers say? How did they interpret Revelation and what Babylon is? And so I believe in the early church's phrase, Babylon became the code word for the systems of Satan and the kingdoms of this world. You know, that cosmos language we just talked about. So again, um, Tertullian says, so again, Babylon in the writings of our own John is the figure of the city of Rome, for she is uh, equally great and proud of her sway. So that's Tertullian saying that Babylon in Revelation equals Rome. Um uh, he says, again, we are called away from even dwelling in Babylon of John's revelation. How much, how much more so is its pomp? Um, we also have Hippolytus said to me, blessed John, apostle of the disciple of our Lord. What did you see and hear concerning Babylon? Arise and speak for it, Rome, sent you into banishment. So there, another guy connecting Babylon to Rome. Um, uh, Vic Tinus, uh, his 280, uh, it says, um, the great overthrow of Babylon, that is the Roman state. So when we look at Babylon in the Bible, we see it as a symbol of empire, and some take this as the last empire, but we can take it, I believe, as any empire or system that stands against the kingdom of God. Um, even in 1 Peter 5.10, it talks about the church in Babylon um, greeting you, and now Babylon at the time of First Peter was written, wasn't a nation anymore. So that's got to tell you something that Babylon is used as a, as a code word. And so we need to, we need to look if we can use uh, the phrase Babylon. I believe that it's a code word or an overarching type of any kind of nation or power that sets itself up against God, anything that's under the control of the systems of Satan. And as we saw, especially in first uh, John five, that all of the kingdoms of this world are under Satan and what we saw from Jesus and his temptation that Satan had the power to give these kingdoms over to, over to Jesus because he's in charge of them. We need to ask ourselves, especially in our Western context, um, me as in uh, living in America is, do we think of America more as, I guess you would say a type of a modern day Israel, or is it a type of a biblical Babylon? So is America more a type of a biblical Israel or is it a type of a biblical Babylon? This is the question we need to ask ourselves. And how are we as citizens of the kingdom, as believers, as ones who pledge our allegiance to Jesus as our king, how are we to give our allegiances to um, the nation that we live in? And so this brings up the question is, and some don't like this word empire. <laughs> um, so I guess you could sub out empire for superpower. Um, and we're okay calling America a superpower. So we got to ask like, really like, what is America? And I've, uh, Brian Zahn has nailed this down to kind of four things. So one, it's a nation. Um, we know 1776 founded 50 States now. Um, and I believe God loves nations. Uh, second thing is America is a culture. So we have the, you know, the American dream, we got American food, you know, apple pie, uh, we got music, we've got sports. Um, America is a culture. I believe America is also an empire. It's kind of the current superpower in the world. And I think that um, 
empires, like we said, uh, rich, powerful nations that believe they have the right to rule other nations and manifest destiny to shape history. Um, you know, some might say that America really doesn't rule other nations. I mean, we've got military bases all over the place. And um, from when America was founded, yeah, we kind of were empirical and took over a bunch of land. But um, and even on America's seal, it states the Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means the new order of the ages. So um, I think that's kind of problematic because the right to rule other nations is the manifest destiny um, and the manifest destiny to shape history is what God has given to Jesus. Um, he, Jesus is, is the king. So uh, I think that sometimes we need to kind of watch our, our allegiances. Um, we can, yeah, you can love your country, but just don't love it the same way that you love Jesus. Like uh, the way that I love playing guitar or I love baseball. Um, it's not a love the same way that I love and pledge allegiance to Jesus. Um, the fourth thing is um, I believe America is a religion. Uh, we see a lot of this in kind of nationalistic tendencies. Um, you see that we have our own creation stories of how the nation was founded. Uh, we have our sacred texts, the constitution in um, Christianity, but we have the Bible. Um, there's hallowed saints. So, you know, presidents and, and war heroes. And we have saints in Christianity that we look up to, those who have great men and women who had gone before us in the faith who are examples. Um, we have sacred ground here in America, you know, the monuments and things like that. We have holy days, uh, Memorial Day, Independence Day. Um, there are hymns, the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. There's um, symbols to pledge to. The, the flag. Uh, we celebrate soldiers dying on our behalf. And, and uh, you could see a whole lot of American religion is almost a parody of Christianity at times. And um, it, when you, even when you go in the DC rotunda, um, you see this art piece called the apotheosis of Washington. And it, uh, the man who created it was, was a religious uh, painter. And it's a scene of Washington uh, seated between the God of victory and the God of liberty and uh, in the Capitol Rotunda. And it's referred to there, actually, when you go on a tour, they'll call it a temple. And the room is filled with pictures of American heroes. Uh, I guess you could say idols in the temple. Um, Lincoln Memorial is fashioned after a, a, a pagan Greek temple. And it even says in there that in this temple, in our hearts, um, whom he who saved the union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Uh, we have a lot of entanglement, I think, even with our verbiage mixing up with the Bible. We have Mike Pence, who in a campaign rally before the election back then, uh, replaced uh, Jesus in the verse from Hebrews, let us fix our eyes on uh, on on Jesus. Uh, he changed it out with let us fix our eyes on old glory, substituting Jesus for the flag. Uh, America's called a city on a hill. Um, the city on the hill in the Bible is referred to as the people of God. Um, and a lot of, so like we see a lot of this is built into, you know, into our culture and I'm not, so I think, I believe we could say that America is an empire, though it is the, probably the best and maybe the kindest empire that's been on in the face of history. And, but I, I think it's safe to say that America is an empire nonetheless. And like we said before, I think whether we love America and we're supposed to hope for the best and we'll get into that how we should live and how we shouldn't live in an empire um, I think that we need to be wary of our allegiances but it's it's okay to seek the best for our nation and to appreciate the freedoms that we have so I'm not saying that oh America's bad America's evil and we need to get rid of America I'm just saying that as Christians the believers our primary allegiance can't be to our country we need to watch our entanglement. It needs to be to Jesus. So is nationalism bad? Is nationalism an idol? I think um, when we look at patriotism, if you have pride that encourages you to be a respectful citizen, I don't think, it, and it doesn't compromise your baptismal identity to the kingdom of God, then I think that, yeah, then um, patriotism to an extent, a small extent is fine. Um, but if you mean like religious devotion and nationalism, at the expense and the well-beings of other nations, then I think that that is, is very problematic. Um, I heard it said recently in this kind of uh, 
it shocked me a little bit and made me think, um, but it's absolutely true is that we have more in common with, and we should have more loyalty toward a Christian, maybe a Christian Palestinian, is it? or a Christian from Afghanistan, or a Christian from Iran, or a Christian from China, than we should have um, toward a non-Christian American. So if your loyalty or um, the way that maybe you think politically gives you more loyalty toward a non-Christian American than it does towards a brother or sister in Christ, and I think you might need to check your heart there. And sadly, evangelicals have gotten in bed either with their candidate or their party, and sometimes thus with uh, civic religion. And so I think it's, we need to ask ourselves, really, um, I know that people bring up the argument that, oh, well, we have a, a republic where uh, Rome wasn't that way. It was more of a totalitarian dictatorship with, with, with Caesar. But, I mean, would you see the early Christians flying the Roman flag in their house churches? Would you see them pledging allegiance to Caesar? Just questions to think about. Um, so it kind of brings me to thinking of uh, Caiaphas when Jesus is uh, on trial and they say, talking about him as their king, and they say, oh, we have no king but Caesar, the religious majority getting in bed with the empire at that point. So the early church was really distinct on, had some sharp distinctions between empire and kingdom. And um, it leaves me the question is why isn't the, why doesn't church today sound anything like the early church? Um, so a few of these is uh, Tertullian. Um, he lived 160 to 220 AD. He says, shall we carry a flag? No, it is a rival to Christ. Uh, you have uh, Spiritus, who was martyred in 180. He says, I recognize no empire of this present age. He's talking about only recognizing the kingdom of God. Um, Tatian of, the, of Assyria says, I do not wish to be a ruler. I do not strive for wealth. I refuse offices connected with military command. Um, Justin Martyr says, God called Abraham and commanded him to go out from the country where he was living. With this call, God has roused us all, and we have all left the state. We have renounced all the things of the, that the world offers. The gods of the nations are demons. Um, Marcellus the Centurion, after he um, had left the army of Emperor uh, Diocletian in 298 AD, says, I serve Jesus Christ, the eternal king. I will no longer serve your emperors. It is not right for a Christian to serve the armies of this world. He was sentenced to death then, and he prayed to God to bless his executors as he was killed. Uh, we have Hippolytus of Rome, uh, a military commander or a civic magistrate, so that's a politician, um, must resign or be rejected. If a believer seeks to become a soldier, he must be rejected, for he has despised God. Um, Origen says, it is not for the purpose of escaping public duties that Christians decline public offices but that they may reserve themselves for a more necessary service in the church of God for the salvation of men. And this is the service um, that is all that is once necessary and right. And this kind of brings us, and we didn't talk about this in our class last night. We had it in our notes and kind of skipped over it because of time. But when you look at, um, and Ryan and I have done a whole episode on the mark of the beast and the mark of the beast. Um, and this is found in Revelation 13, um, and it ties into this conversation. Um, now, a lot of people will um, will take the mark of the beast as some end times thing, but Revelation, remember, it was written to seven churches in the first century, so it must mean something to them, not just something for us if we're living in the end times. According to Hebrews, we've all been living in the end times since Jesus rose from the dead. Um, but and this ties into today's conversation about kingdom loyalty. So when we look in Revelation 13, there's two beasts. There's one from the land and one from the sea. And we talked about that um, Revelation is very symbolic. And so I believe that the biblical symbolism of the land meant Israel. So we got the beast from the land. Um, the beast from the sea means Gentiles. So the land beast coming from Israel. So uh, later this, this land beast is connected to the, the, um, the false prophet. Um, and so you have the false prophet and the dragon, which is um, 
and the beast. So we see the sea beast here is is Rome, and six 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 is actually the number of Caesar Nero when you transliterate it into when you translate it into Hebrew and you use the gematria, um, the Hebrew letter for each of those. Um, each, each Hebrew letter has a number connected with it. And so when you, when you add them all up, it, when you have Caesar Nero, it comes to 666. And we also see 666 connected in 1 Kings 10, 14 to the amount of talents that Solomon received connected basically to getting in bed with foreign affairs, with foreign armies, not trusting in the Lord, not um, being set apart as Israel was supposed to be kingdom of God people, but rather putting their trust in the kingdoms of this world. And so Solomon was condemned for that. Um, it, God didn't look very favorably on, uh, favorable on that, but he received 666 talents. So I don't think that um, numbers mean, like Ryan and I have talked about a lot in our videos, numbers mean things in Hebrew. And so when we look at 666, it's the only other time you find it in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, is here. And it's about getting in bed with the empire, getting in bed with the nations that are underneath um, the principalities and powers underneath um, these, these demons underneath Satan. So to, I believe to take the mark of the beast isn't a microchip or taking a vaccine or anything like that. It's about your allegiance to the empire. It's about forsaking your baptismal identity. And it's about, it's about pledging allegiance to the kingdoms of this world versus the kingdoms of God. And I believe that these churches had um, these seven churches in Revelation were tempted to live a comfortable life by pledging their allegiance to the empire, um, rather than living as reflections of Christ and living as the church, the called, uh, the, the called forth ones, the ecclesia of God. Um, and so when we say, see to the right hand in the forehead, the, um, taking a mark on it. It's symbolic of in Deuteronomy, where it speaks of having God's words on your hands um, and on your head, which symbolizes knowing God and doing his will, imaging God. We talked about Christiformity in the first week. Uh, the mark of the beast is symbolic of having the words or the mark of the powers of this world and doing their bidding and their doing. So uh, they symbolize each other. And so we know you can't serve two masters. Um, if we look over at Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 to 5, it talks about a different mark. And I looked and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name and having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of a loud thunder. And the voice, which I heard was like the sound of a harpist playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, but no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Um, then Revelation 18, verse four, we see this angel um, proclaiming the come out of Babylon, come out of her. Don't be tainted by her. Um, basically, don't take the mark. <laughs> what I was saying. So I believe the mark of the beast is more connected to political allegiances, um, turning your heart from the kingdom of God, putting your trust in the kingdoms of this world versus, versus the way of God. So we got to look at uh, then what is the way of the exile? If... Uh, if, like we said, we need to look at America less like a biblical Israel and more like a biblical Babylon, how do we live as exiles in the midst of, of these nations? And like I've said throughout this video, we're not, I'm not calling you to hate America. I mean, I particularly like America and I'm, um, and I like the freedoms, uh, that I have to practice religion. And, um, and I very much appreciate those and thank God. And I will, do what I can to keep those freedoms. But if they are taken away, my allegiance is going to be with the kingdom of God. And my allegiance is not going to be with, with, with America. Um, so ways not to live as exiles. One would be tribalism. So tribalism leads us to hate and to violence. We often see this with Democrat versus Republican, or um, and I believe it's a play of the devil creating this us versus them uh, dichotomy. And i and it causes us 
to concentrate on people and to degrade them as images of God. It causes us, and we're called to love our neighbor. We're basically called to, you know what? We don't have enemies. As kingdom of God, we're called to love our enemies. And we're supposed to call them a neighbor. Remember, everyone is our neighbor. When you look at the story of the Good Samaritan, that's how Jesus answers that. So if you're a Christian and your brother or sister doesn't vote the same way as you, what's your response? Um, if your response is getting worked up or getting angry at, at someone, it might indicate that you might have an idol in your life that you allow your political party to uh, trump unity in Jesus. So it might just be something to think about and bring before the Lord and surrender to him. Um, I know personal story. Um, I, when I used to, uh, before I was pastor, I, I was very big into politics and I usually had an hour drive to work where I was working um, as a retail store manager. And I would listen to talk radio the whole way there, whole way back two hours a day, over two hours a day. And it was, um, it was dominating a lot of my thought life. And I felt like God was calling me to give that up. And I gave that up. And that's really when I started diving into scriptures and really studying deep and decided to go to seminary and, and things like, like that. And so this really is, um, I think it can really entangle people getting caught up in, caught up in politics. I mean, it's not bad to know what's going on in your world, but when it dominates your life, it's, it's, it becomes an idol. And I would get mad at people who didn't see things politically the same way as me. And it's something that I needed God to really work on in my heart. And I've kind of swung a lot the other way. So uh, next is political parties. Um, we see that Jesus called both a zealot and a tax collector to be his disciples. And those were the opposite sides of the political spectrum. But they were called to transcend their earthly labels and be disciples of Christ. Um, essentially, when Jesus interacts with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we have kind of a picture of the progressive left and the conservative right. And Jesus transcends both of those things. He doesn't side with the Pharisees. He doesn't side with the Sadducees. He, he essentially says that the kingdom of God is neither. Um, and it isn't found in either of these worldly systems or in partisan politics at all. Um, next thing is really devotion to politics, I think, is, is a big hindrance in the church. And what does Jesus say in Mark 12, 17, um, that he's uh, asked about paying taxes and a guy shows him, he says, give me a denarius. And so he, he, he gets this coin and he asks them whose picture is on it. And um, they say, well, it's Caesar's. And he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. A thing I don't think a lot of people realize about that often um, the, these coins, since they were metallic, you could use them almost like a mirror. And when you looked in them, because there wasn't a whole lot of mirrors back then, um, you would, I think Caesar wanted you to see the image of Caesar within yourself. When you're looking into that, uh, it, it promoted uh, political loyalty in that. Um, but at the same time, Jesus is saying, give to God what is God's and what is God's. We are created in the image of God. So we're supposed to give our whole self to God. Caesar can have his his coin, but you need to devote your whole life to God. And every human is created in the image of God. So even those who might not agree, agree with you politically, they deserve your respect and your love. And they aren't enemies because remember, Jesus says you don't have enemies because they're all your neighbors. All right. Um, the next is violence. So Jesus calls us, calls blessed the peacemakers, says no eye for an eye to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to put away your swords. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. So do we take the Sermon on the Mount literally? Um, it's the radical way Jesus called us to live. So doing things the way, like we said, the ways the systems of this world do it, um, it, it doesn't add up. And now, the next thing is the seven mountain mandate. And we've done videos on this. This is the idea that uh, there's seven mountains in society and Christians jobs. If they're doing their job right, they would be on the top of every one of those mountains and they would take over the culture and make a Christian culture. So this reminds me, and we've talked about it a few times already in this episode, is when Jesus is offered the kingdoms of this world, he doesn't worship Satan. I mean, all these systems, like we said, are under the control of the evil one, the power of, they're under the power of the prince of the air. Um, which which is Satan. So 
And notice Jesus doesn't dispute that they belong to him. So why are we trying to overtake the the systems of this world? You know, it, it I just sometimes laugh in my in my head a little bit um, when I hear somebody who wants to go into politics be like, oh, I want to grow up and be a high-ranking official in the system of Satan. <laughs> you know, um, I think too often the thing with the church and what they get wrong is they don't realize the way of Jesus is not the way of gaining power. It's not power over, it's power under. You know, we talked about this the first week is Jesus's way and the way he showed us to live was by washing people's feet, right? Um, metaphorically, that's basically, there's nothing that we're called to serve. And so, and when we look at also that God um, didn't, when he delivered the Hebrews from Egypt, he didn't call them to go rise up to all these different mountains in the Egyptian society. And then, then they would be free when they don't have oppressors anymore. No, he, he called them out from the world. He called them out from Egypt. Um, so we're not called to go bunker down in the desert or anything, but we're supposed to live as exiles. And we're going to look at a little bit of, of how to do that. Um, so Jeremiah 29 five to seven, and this is literally said to people who are, were in literal Babylon. Um, so Jeremiah 29, five to seven says, uh, Jeremiah's instructions are this, uh, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, don't decrease. Also seek peace and prosperity for your city, which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And then when we look at First Peter, so yeah, that was written to those literally in Babylon. But when we look at First Peter, which I believe um, is written to a Gentile audience, and a majority, I believe, scholars think that Peter's audience was majority Gentile, um, it, it looks at these people who are natives in this area that Peter's writing to and probably lived there their whole life. And Peter in like the first couple of verses of first Peter calls them exiles, but they've lived there their whole lives. They were native and probably some of them were even citizens, Roman citizens there, but yet Peter calls them exiles. And we see through the whole book of first Peter of how um, Peter calls these people to um, because of their identity to the kingdom of God and through their baptism, he calls them to be good examples in their culture of the kingdom of God. But he never tells them to rise up to political positions or take up up violence or do an in their infiltration miss mission is the church. The church should be so beautiful and attractive that it pulls people out of the kingdoms of the world and into it. It's supposed to be the better place rather than transforming the culture. It's supposed to be its own culture. Um, we got the book of Daniel, um, which if you look at that, it's all about um, being the third way. It's not being subversive uh, like to the point of uh, taking up uh violence against your culture to overthrow them or caving in to culture, which we see kind of a lot on both, both sides, people rising up for that, but it, it's called to um, be an example through, through service, but also drawing the line. We saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bow down to the idols. Daniel wouldn't pray to the king. They wouldn't cross certain lines that they knew um, would compromise their allegiance and their loyalty to Yahweh. So um, with all of this, we, we shouldn't be able, um, when we look at nationalism, it, it we shouldn't give up our baptismal identity, which like we said, is the kingdom of God, because we can only serve one master. And Jesus calls us to radical allegiance to his kingdom alone. And so like we said, Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve two masters. You'll either love one and hate the other or hate one and love the other. And Paul tells Timothy um, this in 2 Timothy uh, 2, 4. So 2 Timothy 2, verse 4 says, No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So he's talking about this kind of a, a metaphor of us being called into the kingdom of God, that our focus shouldn't be on 
the systems of this world or entangled in um, civilian affairs, but our marching orders come from Christ. And how are we to live out and embody his life um, through the church to those around us? And I think sometimes that, um, like James says, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And I think that a lot of times in the church, uh, we see a lot of friendship with the world and we're called to seek first God's kingdom, uh, Matthew 6, 33, um, and his righteousness. Um, so we got to ask, is America God's established rule here on the earth? And is Jesus just the secretary of afterlife affairs? Some American Christians kind of seem to act like that, but we see the titles given to Jesus in the Bible were extremely political, that he is Lord as a title, title given to Caesar. He's the son of God, title given to Caesar. He's the son of man. He's the one who basically in the son of man story in Daniel 7, the one who conquers all the nations. Um, he's Christ and Messiah. Like we said, that's last week, that's kingly language. And remember when we talked about Acts 17 last week, that those who Paul turning the world upside down, it's, and then two chapters later in Acts 19, there's a riot because they're proclaiming Christ is king and Caesar is not. Um, so Jesus' kingdom, like we said, is not of this world. It's meaning that it's not like the kingdoms and the empires of this world. So, and Jesus said that they lord over people, but his kingdom is different. So we need to look at how is Jesus's kingdom different as we wrap up today. And there's five examples that we took, um, I took these actually from uh, the uh, website rivalnations.org, I believe it's called. Uh, so just Google ri the website Rival Nations. They got a lot of really good articles on there, but they have an article that I'm going to kind of summarize here. It's called Five Differences Between the Kingdom of God and Empire. And the first thing is different of trust. So empires trust in the sword. They trust in violence. Um, the kingdom of God trusts in the power of the cross. So the nations trust their military might and their economy for safety and security, while the kingdom of God trusts in the nonviolent way of Jesus. So these empires advance by exercising power over people. Um, they want to control people. Um, the kingdom of God exercises power under people, power through service, power through the last being first, the first being last. Um, the kingdom of God um, is defined by sacrifice and the refusal to retaliate. The second thing is different of aims, the difference of aims. So the empire seeks to control behavior, and we can see a whole lot of that here in these COVID times, can't we? Um, while the kingdom of God seeks to transform lives from the inside out. So the nations of this world use coercion and threat of punishment, while the kingdom of God works on the heart. We transform people through God's spirit. He transforms them through the work of Christ, and the, the kingdom of God is centered exclusively on carrying out God's will, even if it requires the sacrificing of one's interests, one's security, one's comfort. And so that's the aim that we're called to. Uh, the third thing is a different of scope. Um, empires are intrinsically tribal. And we talked about this tribalism, uh, especially with political parties. Um, and they're heavily interested on defending, if not advancing their own interests or the interests of their people group and their nation. And we talked about um, the analogy earlier that you have more in common with, uh, let's say, uh, a Palestinian Christian than you should with a non-believing American. And I think that that kind of is a little cognitive dissonance for some of us. Um, so the, the, the aim of uh, the kingdom of God, the, the, the scope of that is that there are no, that um, we're intrinsically universal and that it centers simply on loving as Jesus loves instead of the tribalistic nature that like we've been talking about over and over that we have no enemies, that um, everyone is our neighbor, that we love as Jesus loved. He died for the world, so we love. Um, the next thing, number four, is different of this a difference of responses. Empires are in, in, are intrinsically tit for tat kingdoms. So their motto is eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But what does Jesus say in response to that? He says to turn the other cheek, to never return evil for evil, or violence for violence. That's in uh, Romans twelve seventeen, First Peter three nine. 
We are rather to manifest the unique kingdom of God by returning evil with good and turning the other cheek, going a second mile, loving and praying for our enemies. Um, and we're not supposed to receive, uh, to seek retaliation, but we're supposed to seek the well-being of our enemy. Now, the fifth thing is the difference in battles. Empires have earthly enemies and thus fight earthly battles. Uh, the kingdom of God, however, is defined by no earthly enemies. And we've talked about this kind of over and over that everyone is our neighbor and we're called to love our neighbors. Um, our warfare in the kingdom of God is not against flesh and blood, as we see in Ephesians 6.12, but against the rulers, authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present age, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And these are the ones pulling the strings behind these nations and trying to get us to be tribalistic. Um, and the next thing I think that we, uh, two more things as we conclude here um, that we need to do is how we can live out as exiles is to honor and pray for our leaders, honor and pray for the emperor. We see this in 1 Peter 2.17 in 1 Timothy uh, 2, 1 and 2, that we are, we are called as the church to pray for our leaders, to seek the best for our nation, um, and, and yeah, to pray for it, because as our, if our nation prospers, we prosper, as we saw in Jeremiah 29. Um, and the last thing, I think a, a lot of people um, might not really think of this, um, is lead a quiet life. First Thessalonians 4, 11 and following, it says, um, is that that Paul is encouraging them to lead a quiet life. So I think that really, if we do decide to vote, and some people are really into that and some not so much that, um, or even get in, involved with politics, it should be in supporting things that allow us to live and give us freedoms to do kingdom things. Um, so we watched uh, the Bible Project's video, The Way of the Exile, kind of in concluding our class last night. So I encourage you to go watch that, The Way of the Exile video by Bible Project. Um, and so let's, as we conclude, let's not get concerned so much and get caught up and entangled in civilian affairs, but follow the marching orders to be light bearers and transfer people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and pledge our allegiance to the Lamb. Um, he calls us out of her, out of Babylon. Uh, to follow his way into the new creation um, and to live by his law, which um, we'll get into in a few weeks from now. It's a nonviolent, self-giving, cross-shaped way, way of living. And we're not, like we said, as the church, we're not called to change the world systems, but as the church, we're supposed to be embodying the change. We're supposed to be the change, to be the kingdom of God here on the earth within our church, our ecclesia fellowships. Um, so I think with a lot of this, um, I reflect a lot, and I'm in closing on um, Romans 12, verse 2, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So to not be caught up in the ways of this world. Um, we don't think the ways of this world. We have the minds of the king, and so we need to uh, rule, or we need to co-rule with him and our, have our focus on his rule so that we can we can embody him. So um so next week, we are going to look at uh, the people of God. So we're going to look at the church and what's the church's role here on earth and what, um, what are we as, as the church. So um, stay tuned for that. Uh, thanks for um, listening and, uh, and being part of this series. Uh, appreciate you guys. Uh, may God bless you and keep you. Have a great day.